Wake up! Sorry if I startled some of you. There's coffee in the lobby. We're beginning this new year on our knees as we have the last few years. 40 days of prayer. Thank you, Dr. Stumbo, for that, that beginning, that introduction to this 40 days of prayer. How many of you have made, be honest now, how many of you made New Year's resolutions? Okay. Like three of you, okay. I'm not going to ask how many have kept them, because statistically speaking, most of you have already failed with your New Year's resolutions. But remember, today's the first day of the rest of your life, so you can start over. Every day is a new day, a new fresh opportunity, a gift from God. Uh, listen, my name's Kirk, and uh, I am, I'm really excited about this series. Uh, we've done this now three years in a row. We're joining with Alliance churches from all over the country for 40 days of prayer. And it was already mentioned, but I just want to throw this QR code up again. It's also found in your flyer. If you're not already doing the devotional readings, and they take about, oh, I don't know, two minutes, maybe. Can you give God two minutes a day? I hope so. Uh, it's a, a, just a simple little devotional each day and a prayer to lead you and guide you. And you're not behind. You just start today. It's all good. But these 40 days, we're going to be looking at various themes, emphasizing this word now, the, the idea of urgency, that we often wait for some day to come. Maybe some of you remember seeing these little discs that said T-U-I-T. How many of you know what I'm talking about? What is it? It's around to it, you know. So one day I'll get around to it. And it was, it was like a gag thing a few, several years ago. But we think, well, someday, someday, someday. But family, we don't know how many days we have left. And what I want to instill in you, and, and really what I think this whole series is about, is a sense of urgency that the day is now, the time is now, that we need to be intentional about everything that we do. So this, this year, we're starting out with 40 days of prayer, and I want to make sure you know about that QR code. The other thing that Pastor Donald mentioned is the Bible recap. How many of you have started the Bible recap with us? Okay. Uh, this, is, this is a fantastic way for you to get in God's Word. And the devotionals, uh, their video devotionals, their podcasts, or there's all sorts of ways that you can access this information. But we're reading through the Bible together in a year. Now, the last three, last six years, we've been doing a kind of a two-year program. This is a one-year program. We're going to read through the entire Bible. Again, if, if you haven't started with us, it's not too late. December, it's too late. So start now. You're maybe just a few days behind, but I encourage you, there, there's probably nothing more important, nothing more valuable you can do this new year than read through God's Word. And the fact that we read through it together makes conversations really, really fun. Because this morning I read through several chapters in the book of Job. And some of you read through a few chapters of the book of Job this morning too. And we can talk and we can compare and we have a common language and a common vocabulary. It's like, oh, oh you read that too? And so I'm just urging you, family. I, 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 don't, I don't make pleas of this urgency often, but you will not regret reading through God's Word and studying it together as a family. I just have to pause and say, I was, I was re reading through the chorus that we sang a few moments ago. Oh God, be my everything, be my delight. Be Jesus my glory, my soul satisfied. Oh God, be my everything, be my delight, be Jesus my glory, my soul satisfied. If I had a New Year's resolution, family, this is it. That Jesus would be my glory. That my soul would be satisfied not in all the stuff I can purchase on Amazon and, and not all the football games that I can watch. Not in even the pleasure and delight that I find in my children and grandchildren and in my wife but that Jesus would be my delight. And I guarantee you, you're never going to find satisfaction in anything or anyone else but Jesus. 
All right. So this year's theme, 40 Days of Prayer, we talked about now. The time is now. This idea of urgency. And if you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 13 today. So you can turn your Bibles on or, or turn to that passage. Romans chapter 13. There's a, there's a Senegalese proverb. I hope I pronounced that right. Senegalese proverb. It says this, the opportunity that God sends us does not wake up those that are asleep. The opportunities that God sends us, are, are they're not available for those who are asleep. We need to wake up. Our theme today, wake up. Wake up now. God is on the move. God is active. He's doing things. He's moving in our nation. He's moving in our city. He's moving in our world. You have to, have be wake, you have to wake up to have eyes to see what he's about. Several years ago, Henry, Ra Henry Blackaby wrote a terrific book called experiencing God. And in it, he said, it's not a matter of us saying, God bless my plans, but to find out what God is already doing and join him in the work that he's doing. If you've ever been uh, whitewater rafting, you know that there's a current, that the, there's a river that's moving very, very quickly with immense force, sometimes deadly force. And if you ever get in a whitewater raft and try to take that raft upstream, you're in for a tremendous frustration and futility. And yet if the purpose of you being on that raft is to go downstream, to follow the flow of the river, you know it's an exciting and it can almost be a relaxing experience as you go with the flow, as they say. Before we dive into our text, let's pray. Almighty God, I thank you for this new day, for this new year. For some of us, it feels like the year's almost old because it's nearly a week old. And yet, this is our first time gathering together as family in 2024. I pray you would lead us not only in these 40 days of prayer, you would lead us not only as we study your word, but in our, our daily life, that, that these 366 days this year, would be about discovering who you are, about bringing you glory, about experiencing our joy and delight in you and satisfaction. Jesus, we want this year and every year to be about you and making your name great. We're not here to make a name for ourselves, but simply to proclaim Jesus is Lord. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Several weeks ago, we looked at this word submit. Every, it says everyone must submit. Submit is an offensive word in our culture, isn't it? No one wants to submit to anyone or anything. Because truth is whatever I feel, and I'm in charge, and it's my idea to pursue happiness and everyone should submit to my desires and whims to make me happy, which is a wonderful, wonderful approach to take if you're the only person in the room. We talked about Paul's instructions on marriage where he wrote, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. See, God has a plan. He has a purpose in the way that we are to act, to behave, to even deal with one another in society. And don't worry, this isn't a sermon about politics, but these instructions seem universal so long as following them doesn't ever violate the rest of Scripture. Anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. Let me translate this for some of you. If you're on I-75 and you're going the speed limit and you see a police officer, you will have no anxiety, no fear whatsoever. If, on the other hand, you're going 20 over, you might panic a little bit. See, authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Now, say whatever you want to about our government. I will tell you this. 
our government, our society, I think, is much healthier, stronger, more vibrant, and dare I say godly, than the Roman Empire when this was written. Do a little historical research if you need to. Roman Empire was pretty messed up. And so before you start thinking, well, you don't understand our culture, the Roman Empire was pretty, pretty messed up. The authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Again, obey the law unless it violates God's law. Now there are three institutions that God has created. Believe it or not, and I know sometimes this is a stretch, God created government. It was his idea. It was his idea that there would be people in authority that would lead others, that would set a great example for others to follow, that would have the best interests of those that they serve at heart. I know sometimes that gets a little messed up and corrupted and power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But government was God's design. He had two other institutions that God created. Anyone know what those might be? The church is one of them, yes. The family of God is part of God's creation. It was part of his design. He wanted a spiritual family where we were spiritual siblings and we would submit, not to me, but to King Jesus. And the other institution that God created besides government and besides the church is family, right? Biological family. Sometimes that definition gets expanded because of a number of circumstances, but family. We were created to live in community with one another and family. All these were created to be a blessing, and yet all are capable of corruption and abuse. We're all sinners. We need authority. We need to submit to one another. We need accountability. I am a man under accountability. I am not the boss around here. Jesus Christ is a senior pastor. I submit to our board of elders. I submit to Thomas George, our district superintendent. Excuse me, Dr. Thomas George, our district superintendent. Even if you don't like the people that are in office, we need to respect the office because God ordained government. It was his idea. Okay. As if you're not already frustrated by these words. Pay your taxes, too. Hey, I don't write the mail. I just deliver it, folks. All right? Pay your taxes, too, for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. There's a great scene in two of the Gospels where religious leaders were trying to trap Jesus with this question. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through the duplicity and said to them, show me a denarius, that's a coin, whose image and inscription are on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said, then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Which begs the question, what is God's? My Bible says that we are to give to God all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. So pretty much everything is God's. All we have belongs to God. We are just his stewards. Okay, back to Romans 13. I'm getting convicted. Oh, nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the, the, the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say... You must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and others are summed up in this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Would you just repeat that with me? Love your neighbor as yourself. That would be a good news resolution, by the way. It'd also be obedient to what Jesus said. And it's really the best way to summarize this whole book in terms of instructions and commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Easier said than done, but it's worth remembering. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of God's love, God's law. Love 
That's a sign of spiritual maturity. Some of you have been a part of this church family for decades. I mean, long before even I was born. But time does not always equal maturity. There's this expression, well, they're older and wiser. Mm, there are some people that are older and not so wise. You like that one, huh? Thanks, Mike. I appreciate the encouragement. Love, that's the sign of maturity. I don't care how much of the Bible you memorize, whether you know the Greek and Hebrew, whether you can answer all the questions in Bible Monopoly, Bible trivia. If you don't have love, 1 Corinthians 13 says, you're just noise. You're like a sounding gong, a clanging cymbal. Love. This is the goal. And it's not something we try to do, that we manufacture, that we produce, that we try harder. Love ultimately comes from experiencing it, from receiving it, and then letting the overflow come to others. So how do we experience more of God's love? We get in his word. We read the promises. We spend time with him. We pray. We do life with God. And we realize those things even that we sang about this morning. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. What a wonderful thing to be called a son or daughter of the most high God. To know that Jesus died for me. Gave his very life. If you were the only person that ever walked the face of the earth, Jesus would have come to this earth, lived in cold weather, in damp weather, sickness, disease, temptation, and would have died for you. What an incredible thought. For some of us, we've heard it so many times, it doesn't even register. But that someone actually loved you so much that they died for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. Family, I've said this so many times, you may be sick of it, but the great commandments are to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The writer of Hebrews, excuse me, of Romans said so, we must be people of love because we're people who have been loved by God. That should be our identity. That should be what people, well, the first thing people think of as First Alliance Church is not, oh, that building. It shouldn't be, oh, those, those political people. It should be, those are the most loving people I've ever met in my life. Don't know if I agree with all the stuff they believe in, but there's something unique, something different, something special about them. They are good lovers. So at the beginning of this year, I just want to remind you of what we're all about, what we're called to be about as people of love. Well, I'm incredibly embarrassed at the unloving behavior of many so-called Christians. The reality is that I don't always look out for the best interest of other people, that I fail to love at times, that I'm filled with pride and selfishness, seeking comfort and safety, and my own personal happiness, often at the expense of others around and so I just want to say, like, I'm, I'm with you in this. We're all in this together. It's not like I've gotten this figured out yet. I want to go back to verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. Some godly leaders like J. Hudson Taylor and Charles Spurgeon believe that this means we are to have no financial debts. Owe nothing to anyone except love. Have never gone debt financially for any reason whatsoever. I'm not here to say whether those people are right or wrong, although there's a whole lot of scriptures that talk about how debt can be very, well, it's a trap. It, it can weigh us down. It can be a burden to all of us. But debt, debt is definitely a burden and something to be avoided at almost all costs. But regardless of your financial situation, we are all indebted, called to love one another, to love others as ourselves. Okay, so that's all just set up. Now the sermon begins. Check your watches, everybody. Verse 11. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Wake up, be alert, get ready. 
We just celebrated the first Advent, Jesus coming into the world the first time, but he's coming back, and we need to get ready. We need to get ready for the return of Jesus, and we need to help others get ready for that as well. We don't know when it is. Jesus himself said he didn't know. No man knows the hour. No man knows the day, but Jesus is coming back, and we've got to be ready. It's too late. I, I love the, the late John Wooden basketball coach at UCLA. He said, when opportunity arises, it's too late to prepare. So what are you doing now to prepare for the opportunity? What are you doing now to prepare for Jesus' return? What are you doing now to, to, to be ready for whatever opportunity God might put in your path to love someone, to serve someone, to minister to them? We've got to be ready, family. Tomorrow is not promised. Today is the first day of the rest of your life, and it could be your last. If our purpose in life was merely to pray a prayer and get a get-out-of-hell-free card, well, there's nothing left to do. But there is. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've been commissioned by the Most High God to go and make disciples of all nations. That's for you. That's not a professional Christian thing. That's for all of us, family. We use the phrase restoring God's masterpieces from Ephesians 2.10, but the application is identical. We need to wake up. We need to urge others to wake up too, both believers and not yet believers of Jesus. The greatest way to love our neighbors is to be hope dealers, preaching the good news of Jesus in word and deed. It's not even about getting them ready to die so much as it is about showing them how to live now. The abundant life that Jesus offers, a life of faith, hope, and love. Is it easy? Nope. Comfortable? Hardly. Exciting? Absolutely. Satisfying? more than anything this world can offer. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. What a brilliant metaphor. Get rid of your sin and walk in the light. Confess and repent your junk and let God forgive and redeem. See, we are to wake up and we're also to clean up. The writer of Romans is saying, you need to, we need to get rid of all the junk, all the sin. We need to confess, repent, and follow Jesus. Let's get a wardrobe makeover in 2024, getting rid of our sinful habits and prideful attitudes and put on the armor of God, the fruit of the Spirit, the robe of righteousness. Some of you trust God with what happens after you die. Maybe it's time to trust God with what happens before you die. To surrender this life to him now instead of just waiting for the next one. Some of you need to trust God not just with an hour on Sunday, but the other 167 hours that are going to take place this week. And let me tell you, God can be trusted. God can be trusted, family. He can be trusted in this moment. And he can be trusted this afternoon. He can be trusted tomorrow and through the rest of the week. In fact, God can be trusted every day of 2024, even though we have no idea what that's going to look like. We need to wake up. We need to clean up. And the amazing thing about cleaning up is we don't have to scrub, scrub, scrub. We just have to surrender. Because Jesus did all the heavy lifting. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the earth. He, he is, he is the, the ultimate sacrifice. In, in a few moments, we're going to remember his sacrifice through the sacrament of communion. That Jesus didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. He proved his love. He died for you and for me. And all we have to do is confess our sins and receive the forgiveness that he offers. That's how we clean up. What's your New Year's resolution? I hope it's to join us in 40 days of prayer. I hope it's to study the Bible with us. I, I hope it's to, to love as Jesus loved. To obey God. To live right. And next we're told to grow up. He says, wake up, clean up, and then grow up. 
Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Some of you guys get, you get stuck at the sexual stuff. Oh yeah, sex stuff is bad. Did you, did you hear, did you hear what, what Joe was doing? Did you, the, the sexual things that he's, oh, it's so awful. And we should pray about them. In fact, let's go on the prayer chain and tell everybody we need to pray because they're, they're doing these sexual, quarreling, gossip, jealousy, See, it's a lot like Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery Thursdays, as Pastor Donald said, it's for anyone with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. That's all of us, friends. And this is for all of us, too. Got some honest people in the house. It's worth mentioning again, sexual promiscuity. Sexual immorality. It refers to virtual, any, any sexual activity outside of a marriage between a husband and a wife. Yes, I know it's old school, but that's God's design. You can play the other rules. You can do whatever you want to do. God's given us freedom. But there's consequences anytime we violate God's word. If you're a follower of Jesus, your body's not yours. Your possessions are not yours. Your future is not yours. And in fact, your words, your thoughts, your attitude, your heart, they all need to be surrendered daily to the Lord. Over in 1 Corinthians, it says this, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, God, honor God with your bodies, including your tongue the words that you say, including your mind, the thoughts that you have, including your hands, the deeds that you commit. So we're commanded not to participate in the darkness. Okay, pastor, this is getting really heavy. So what's the alternative? Give us some encouragement, pastor. This is a new year. Fire us up. Paul returns to the clothing metaphor, and he says, instead... Clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Charles Spurgeon said this, the rags of sin must come off if we put on the robe of Christ. See, what Paul's saying is we need to take off our old dirty robes. We need to let, set our sin aside and let it go. Let the past be the past and put on robes of righteousness to follow Jesus, to be on his team, to wear his uniform. A few weeks ago, we looked at a familiar passage very similar to this with this wake up now message in the book of Ephesians. It says, for you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said, say it with me, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It's easy for me to stand up here and say, love God and hate sin. The truth is most of us want to do the right things. We want to obey God. We want to love well, but life gets in the way. We get tempted through friends, coworkers, family, and media. We hear everybody's doing it, whether explicitly or implicitly. By the way, not everybody's doing it. The first step in doing anything begins with the mind. We need to know the truth, and the truth will set us free, Jesus said in John 8, 31. This is why we need to be in the scriptures. We need to read them. We need to listen to them. We need to study them. And most of all, we need to obey them. Don't just listen to the word. Do what it says. The expression sleeper in the original Greek is someone who is indifferent to their salvation, one who yields to sloth and sin. And I wonder, does that describe you this morning? Are you a sleeper? Oh, yeah, you wake up Sunday morning for an hour. 
But the rest of the week, are you spiritually sleeping? Are you just kind of going with the flow, doing what everyone's doing? Wake up. Wake up. Clean up. Grow up. The late Keith Green penned these song lyrics a few decades ago. He said, oh, can't you see it's such a sin? The world is sleeping in the dark that the church just can't fight because it's asleep in the light. By the way, the problem with our world is not the world, it's the church. The world's always going to act like the world. The world's always dark. It's always been and it'll always be that way. It really doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to go around and say, the world needs to act like the church. Maybe the church needs to stop acting like the world. If we shine the light, it pierces the darkness. The problem with the world is the church. It's not the world. When we are, do our job, they don't stand a chance. Because greater is he who's in you than who, who he is in the world. How can you be so dead when you've been so well fed? Jesus rose from the grave and you can't even get out of bed, Keith Green said. Family, we're on a mission from God. Restoring masterpieces doesn't just happen. It takes prayer, intentionality, time, and effort. I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you're tuning in online. Thank you. It's a great first step, but it's not the last step. Many of you are actively engaged in making disciples, spiritual conversations, extending hospitality, surrendering your time, talent, and treasures. Well done, good and faithful servants. Some of you have been sitting on the sidelines. Maybe it's indifference. Perhaps you're asleep. It's possible that you want to engage, but you don't know where to start. So let me offer you a few next steps because I like to keep things practical. Here we go. You can write these down if you want to. Pray. We've already been talking about this. 40 days of prayer. Pray, pray, pray. Pray online. 9.30 weekdays. We're on Zoom. 9 a.m. Sorry, 9 a.m. weekdays. 9.30 on Sundays here in the sanctuary. So 9 a.m. Zoom prayer, weekdays, 9.30, out this door, Sunday mornings. Pray. Study. The Bible recap. How much time do you spend in social media? How much time do you spend studying God's Word? 